Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up and we're going to be talking about a bunch of stuff today including the ultraviolet movie locker shutting down. This comes just a week after we were talking about physical versus digital here on the wrap up. We're going to look at maybe blockchain perhaps as a solution to some of these stores shutting down prematurely. Uh, Real-time YouTube analytics and how I use them. Is open source better for protecting your privacy and security online? We'll explore the topic a bit. We'll also look on a related note at Facebook's use of root certificates to do market research and whether or not that was a good idea. And we'll talk about foldable screens and whether or not they'll be coming to a smartphone near you soon. Lots to talk about now, so let's get to it. I want to begin, as we always do, by thanking our newest supporters here on the channel, uh, Ronnie Young, Brian Kirsch, and Matt Jeske. Uh, Matt signed up through the YouTube subscriber program, so I want to thank everybody for their support of the channel this week, everybody who supports the channel on a regular basis, and everyone who watches on an ongoing basis, too, because all of those things equal channel growth. Now, this week's wrap-up is being brought to you by Plex and their Plex Pass add-on. And if you haven't heard of Plex before, it's something we talk about a lot here on the channel because they've been a long-standing supporter of it. Uh, but it's also a product that I use every single day to consume the media that I own and control. So I've got a Plex server set up in my equipment closet. On it, I have uh, rips of my CDs that I have purchased over the years. I have lossless versions of those CDs stored on the server. I've got movies stored on there that I've bought over the years as well, along with TV shows and some photos and whatnot. And basically, it allows you to take all the media that you do own and make it digital so you can consume it the same ways you're doing with all of these streaming services, but you never have to worry about your licenses going away because you've got the physical media. And we've talked a lot about how we can get media into our Plex servers here on the channel. And with the Plex Pass, you can expand the free version of Plex to include DVR recording for live TV. You can even watch your TV shows uh, when you're away from home on your mobile devices. You've got mobile sync for offline viewing if you're going to be taking a plane or a train or something where you don't have good coverage. You get free Plex apps for every platform that they support, and they do support a lot of platforms out there. Parental restrictions for your kids to make sure they don't get into the wrong stuff. You can add subtitles to your content just by searching for the media that you've got in your library and add them automatically in many different languages. You get early access to new features and a lot more. You can see more information at the link you see on screen. And I I want to thank Plex for their long-standing support of the channel. So let's take a look now at the week in review on the Extras channel. We unbox a laptop we'll be looking at a little later this week, so stay tuned for that. We also have a bunch of stuff on the main channel, including a really cool little Air Mouse that came in along with that Pepper Jobs PC we looked at last week. And if you've been looking for a way to control your Windows 10 computer with a remote, uh, this is probably one of the better ones I have seen, and it's only 25 bucks. So if you've been looking for something like that, check out the video. I think you might like what you see there. Uh, we had our monthly sponsored video from Plex. We do a, a little ad at the beginning of the month on the wrap-up and a video at the end of the month. And we looked at how to customize the mobile app because I've seen a few folks writing in with questions about that. So you can check it out to make your viewing experience more efficient. And we looked at a little tiny smartphone called the Unihertz Atom. It is really tiny, actually, and fully functional, too. So really cool little phone. Neat to see little niches developing for different types of smartphone form factors. Good stuff, and you can see all of it down below in the video description. And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind, and this is week 101 of me doing this as a full-time occupation. And I got a new piece of technology coming into the uh, home here. It's a kind of a lifestyle change for us because we finally had to break down and get a minivan. Yep, we did, a Toyota. Uh, so maybe if you're interested in minivan technology, I will take you on a tour of the car. Let me know. I spent about uh, three hours on Saturday negotiating it, and I think I got a pretty good deal on it. So we'll maybe explore that if you're interested. So now it's time to look at something a little bit more fun. This is my YouTube real-time analytics screen that I spend a lot of time in. Uh, because what I like to do is see how my most recently uploaded video is doing, and that helps inform me as to when I should upload the next one. It also gives me an idea as to what you subscribers are most interested in clicking on as well. 
Uh, so this little air mouse thing did not do as well as I expected. It's not a poorly performing video for the channel, at least in the first 48 hours, but some things have done better. And I suspect if this remote here was stamped with Logitech, I would see a much greater amount of initial traffic. I found that people tend to click on brands that they're familiar with a lot more than they might from brands they're not familiar with. So people that are really into uh, remote controls and keyboards, I think, would certainly click on it. But if it was Logitech, again, I think it would probably do a little bit better. Uh, and what I do is I look for when the last video kind of fizzles out. Uh, so you can see here, this one has kind of hit that point now. We've got a lot of viewership early in the first uh, 12 or 15 hours, and then uh, the next day kind of dropped a bit, and now it's just kind of flat. So this is when I would say, okay, time to put the next video up. I used to put up a lot more content than I do now on the main channel uh, because I just thought I just had to keep uploading, which is, of course, what you should be doing. But uh, it was killing momentum for my prior uploaded video, and I was really starting to see some impact from that. So I've been much more strategic about when I release new content based on when the prior video kind of levels off. So usually it's about 48 hours before things flatten out and then we wait a few weeks and then the search algorithm takes over. And if we look at the same screen but ordered by what has been watched the most in the last 48 hours, you can kind of see how this channel works. So you all provided a bulk of the views in the last 48 hours, at least in, in a, on a single video, uh, on the Pepper Jobs remote here. So all of these are subscriber views. The rest of these popular videos over the last 48 hours came from non-subscribers for the most part. So for example, my CES dispatch is still getting watched. Apparently YouTube is seeing a lot of watch time on this video and it keeps putting it in front of more people it thinks might uh, want to see it. So that's been great for the channel. This is probably my best CES ever uh, insofar as viewership, but also watch time. This has been a very good uh, series here and although the other two videos didn't do as well, I think this one brought in uh, several hundred new subscribers. So thank you all for signing up and watching all the stuff I've been doing. Uh, this one's really interesting because I made this video about four and a half years ago and over the last eight months or so, Chromebooks I think have really started uh, becoming something consumers are seriously considering and this video is just doing really well week after week. And it's a great example of, of you know, the evergreen nature of this platform. You can make a video, and if it's relevant, it can stay relevant for a long time and deliver many happy returns for you. Uh, Fire Stick is always doing well here on the channel. People are always curious about those devices, so that is pretty good. Uh, the Huawei Matebook here popped up again, and this is another example of something really neat that I notice from time to time. Uh, sometimes a, a product will go on sale that I reviewed maybe a year ago, and then it becomes like my top video for a day or two because people are really curious about whatever good deal is out there and they're searching for information on it. So sometimes you hit the lottery and get a video that uh, gets a little bit more legs than you thought. This one largely fizzled out because this laptop, I think, disappeared from Walmart's shelves. But it's, it must be on sale somewhere because I'm seeing more traffic on it again. And we've got some other older ones here, too, that still keep getting watched. And again, these are probably all driven by uh, search or recommended videos based on people's prior searches. And this is kind of what I look for to see if there's some kind of trend going on out there. Uh, because I'm always looking for things that you as subscribers are interested in, but I also have to know that uh, the algorithm is looking for stuff too. And these real-time stats give me some good indicators of that. I might start doing a little bit more with Chromebooks just because this video has been doing really, really well. And there's an opportunity there, I think, to provide uh, more useful content. The problem is what? Because I've covered uh, all the things that have changed on Chromebooks since that video was released, but most of those things like Linux and even the Android apps to some degree are things that a lot of consumers aren't all that interested in when they're looking for a Chromebook. And uh, this video really covers the gamut at the moment. So I'm going to think about it a little bit, maybe just do a better version of what I did before, but we'll have to uh, see how this one continues to do. But again, this is just something I look at for making decisions here on the channel, and I thought you might find it interesting. So let's shift gears now to the news. And of course, we have this big ultraviolet shutdown. Now, if you're not familiar with ultraviolet, it was around for uh, quite a long time on DVD and Blu-ray movies. When you bought the movie, there'd be a little coupon in the box. You could type it into the ultraviolet website and then watch it through that service so you didn't have to rip the movie. They were trying to get people to stop ripping uh, and go to something else. And for a while, if I'm not mistaken, you would watch within the Ultraviolet app 
I remember initially I was not pleased with the video quality. It looked pretty lousy, uh, but it did get better. And then they started hooking up with other retailers, uh, similar to what we've seen with Movies Anywhere here in the U.S. But it looks like Movies Anywhere in the U.S. is gaining steam so much that Ultraviolet can't see a path to keeping the doors open any longer. So they uh, sent out an email, which I got on uh, January 31st, letting you know that you've got six months to take some action on this. And uh, what they're going to be doing is shutting down the service, but they're asking you now to connect your Ultraviolet account to other retailers if you haven't done so already. And when you do that, the movies that you have activated through Ultraviolet will be available on those platforms. Except there was a bit of a weird disclaimer on the FAQ on their website. They said, in most cases, we anticipate very little impact. Most existing rights in Ultraviolet libraries are available through linked retailers. Uh, but there might be some disruption, which means some people may lose access to some of their purchases. Now, I don't believe, and I might be mistaken, and I'm sure people will let me know if I am, uh, I don't believe Ultraviolet was selling movies directly. I think you had to get the physical media first. So for the most part, I think people should be okay with their physical copies, but your digital license uh, might be going away if there's some uh, rights issue that uh, happens in the course of this transition. But they don't anticipate this being on a broad scale. Uh, so I think there's probably going to be a handful of titles that don't transfer over very well. Now, they do have partnerships with a number of services. Um, the two that I know that link up with Movies Anywhere is Fandango and Vudu. Uh, so what I would suggest you do, just to be completely safe, is link it up with everything you can, uh, just to make sure that uh, your stuff transfers over in case some weird license is on Vudu, but not on Fandango, for example. Uh, Vudu, of course, is operated by Walmart, and I've been using this a lot as my uh, interconnecting tissue to some other platforms. So what I've been doing is uh, the Vudu uh, has a disc to digital program where you can take a picture of your DVD box and it lets you buy the movie for a couple of bucks. Uh, so I've been doing that. The movie shows up on Vudu and then Movies Anywhere picks it up and it shows up on iTunes and all my other services too. So I think Vudu is probably your best bet, but again, uh, you'll want to make sure you are connecting to everything just to be safe with this. But this is just another example of uh, really how um, fragile I think these digital libraries are. And uh, they can send out an email and just say, hey everybody, we're going out of business in six months. You better do this to secure your content or it's going to be lost forever. And it's kind of scary that we're in this uh, era now where you're buying things, but you're really not buying anything other than a license, which uh, could be revoked at any time. And that brings us to our first question of the week this week on the Q&A section here. And Cartero was responding to our physical versus digital discussion with an idea that maybe it's time for some of these rights holders to adopt blockchain technology for verifying that you have a license to consume the content. And I think this would be a great idea that will probably never happen, unfortunately. But one of the things that I think will emerge out of the craziness that is cryptocurrency is the underlying technology of all of these different coins. Now, of course, Bitcoin kind of started all this stuff with the ability to have a database that nobody controls, but everyone agrees on, and it's largely worked. There have been a lot of issues along the way, but we're seeing more development of this blockchain technology to begin addressing some of the concerns and issues that uh, Bitcoin's initial implementation kind of pointed out. But again, the way this works is that if you were to buy a license and have that license registered on the blockchain, even if the company that you bought the license from goes away, uh, the license itself is on a database that everyone agrees is a database of licenses and it can validate uh, your existence there. And I think this is where all this cryptocurrency stuff is really going to end up. The technology, I think, is going to be a lot more valuable than the currency. And we're starting to see some movement in this direction for commercial licensing. Uh, Censure has been experimenting with it a little bit, and you can read more about that uh, in this article. And I'm sure many other firms are looking at this as well. Uh, we previously talked a few months ago about uh, photo and media copyright in that uh, you can declare your photo to be yours on a blockchain, and it would be something that uh, could help with international copyright issues, for example. There's a lot of really good potential here for blockchain technology to solve a lot of these kinds of problems. And the problems for us consumers are only going to get worse 
And I'm thinking a lot about some controversies right now with Epic uh, launching their new store and trying to get developers to move to their platform versus Steam. Uh, they're giving developers a much bigger cut. Uh, Fortnite really is a Trojan horse that uh, is now in millions upon millions, if not maybe a billion homes right now, and that's a lot of potential customers, so they're looking at this as a tremendous opportunity, but now we're splitting our game libraries once again. Uh, so I've got games on Steam, I've got games on GOG, G-O-G, I've got stuff on the Microsoft Store, I've got stuff that I've got only on my Xbox through the Microsoft Store that I can't play on Windows. Some can go on Windows and the Xbox, I've got my uh, Nintendo Switch. It's really kind of crazy that we're moving to really a commodity hardware platform where everyone's going to be running some kind of X64 processor uh, with the same GPUs and perhaps even same underlying operating systems, but we're going to have all these proprietary stores uh, selling us software that could all disappear if things get a little too competitive between them. Uh, this really does make the argument for having some kind of common thread uh, to validate your licensing. Uh, we're seeing efforts like that with Movies Anywhere, for example, but again, it's not a blockchain thing, so if Movies Anywhere and all their partners disappear, uh, you're unable to reclaim the content you have. And we haven't yet had a big failure yet of one of these digital stores, but I am sure it's going to happen. And this might maybe push consumers to demand more from uh, the developers that are selling software through these things. So we'll have to see where all this goes. This is uncharted territory, but again, you're not buying physical media with these digital things. You're buying licenses that don't exist anywhere in the world and they can go away. So let's see what happens, but lots more to talk about, I'm sure. And our next question comes in here from Jake Tom, who's writing a PhD thesis about how information systems now should be built to accommodate uh, the new privacy regulations in Europe called the GDPR and eventually other privacy legislation that will undoubtedly follow in the coming months. We'll talk more about why these laws are coming in a second. Uh, and over the course of this period, he's realized the first practical step is moving to open source alternatives to uh, commercial software because those open source alternatives do not answer to a commercial authority in many cases and are not going to be leaking your private information even if anonymized uh, to some company that might make money uh, from the use of that. I'm thinking of course about Windows 10 which does a lot of that kind of monitoring. Uh, Apple's OS 10 does as well and different companies are doing different things in regards to how that information is treated but nonetheless uh, there are a lot more things about your private usage that are getting sent out to companies on these closed source platforms versus the open ones. And I totally agree with where he's coming from, but the key sentence here that he brought up is that there is a learning curve involved when using open source software for some problems, but when have you ever lost something by learning something new? Now, of course, that's the perspective I have on life. I love learning new things all the time. This channel is a, a lesson in that. I learn something new every day that I try to apply to what I do throughout the course of the day. But the problem really comes down to the fact that most consumers are not interested in learning new things with their technology. Many of them don't like technology but have to use it. And unfortunately, this is where a lot of these hacks and identity thefts and all the other things that are going on happen. This is how all this private data gets leaked out because they're not aware of exactly what they are doing and uh, we have just an overall lack of technical ability out there. And unfortunately, uh, some of the things that we do to try to protect ourselves are complicated as well. Stephanie McKeon uh, made this great comment on the video I did in regards to two-factor authentication and better securing your accounts. Uh, she says, look, unfortunately, people that really need to be using these examples will never do it because it's way too complicated and cumbersome for the average user. And that is our conundrum. Uh, these privacy leaking devices are easier to use. They have support structures around them. There are stores that you can go to to get things looked at. Uh, you don't have any of that uh, with open source, unfortunately. And it's getting worse. And this is my big concern here is that we've got this massive collection leak of 2.2 billion email address and password combinations out there uh, that no longer is being sold on the dark web. It's just out there for anyone to take. And uh, undoubtedly, one of your email and password combinations are in there. And if you're using the same email and password for everything, uh, you are at risk. It's only a matter of time before somebody stumbles across your name on this list of 2.2 billion and starts plugging in, plugging in that information uh, into various websites to get things going. And open source is not all perfect either. We've seen some examples of some huge vulnerabilities out there 
uh, that have uh, leaked a lot of this private information out. Some of these major uh, hacks that have occurred have been because uh, open source software had a vulnerability that the company hadn't patched properly in many cases. So uh, these are complex systems, no matter which way you look at it. And I do agree with the premise, though, that you will be better protected in that your operating system is not phoning home to a corporation. But again, uh, the friction to getting consumers to adopt this stuff at scale, I think, is going to be extremely difficult. Uh, given how many consumers don't even uh, secure their passwords properly. And then there's the issue of how much value do people really place on their personal privacy. If you ask Facebook, the price is $20 a month. That's what Facebook was paying uh, for people to install a root certificate on their iPhones that gave Facebook a window into everything that those people were doing on that phone. And by everything, I mean everything. They were able to get access to the uh, content, including the content of the content, not just where those folks were visiting. Uh, Facebook was looking to see what apps other people were using and what they were doing on those apps. And if you were taking that 20 bucks a month and you had that root certificate installed on the phone, there was a lot that Facebook could extract from those users, and they were doing it completely willingly just by responding to a display ad that they saw. A lot of the people that participated were kids under the age of 18. Uh, Facebook said that they did get permission from the parents. I would wonder whether or not people really knew what they were uh, getting themselves in for when they installed that root certificate. Uh, but nonetheless, there were many more adults than children in this program who all agreed to it because, hey, it was 20 bucks a month. Why not? And uh, I think that kind of is spelling the underlying issue here that people really don't care. Uh, at least the majority of people really don't care, so much so that they're willing to turn over everything about their lives to a corporation for only $20 a month. That's pretty scary. And in my Q&A for you this week, I would love for you to go out and poll uh, some of your friends and family who are not maybe into technology as much as you are and ask them some questions about privacy and how they feel about it, especially as it relates to Facebook and many of these other platforms, and maybe ask them about how they secure themselves online. I have a feeling that a lot of the people you talk to are not concerned about these things. They feel like they've got nothing to hide, and they likely have very bad password security as well. So uh, have at it. Let's, let's see what everyone says and uh, share your findings down below in the comments. But we all do love our devices, and the next stage of development for our privacy-leaking hardware are foldable screens. And Michael Moore asked on the Facebook group uh, what I thought of them, and he linked to this really neat video about uh, a new Xiaomi screen and phone concept that uh, you can watch here. So we've got the, I think this is the CEO of Xiaomi, using what looks like a kind of an iPad mini sized tablet. Uh, but then what he does is he folds it up and now he's got a much smaller smartphone. And I really like this concept because uh, I have two devices right now that I use depending on what size screen I need. So of course I've got my uh, iPhone 10 here that I use for uh, portable screen and then I've got my iPad uh, which has the 11 inch screen which is a little bit larger for when I'm in a meeting or something where I want to look at a larger document. I like this idea of being able to just unfold the screen when I need something larger and then fold it back in when I need something smaller. Uh, however, I would be concerned about uh, how well this will hold up over time. I can't imagine stressing the display like they're stressing here is going to give you a lot of longevity. Uh, the glass screens that we have on phones now do break a lot, uh, but they do look very nice. And I'd be concerned also about them getting scratched and scuffed up if you have to move to some kind of plastic surface that is foldable. So there's a lot I think they have to figure out with this uh, technology, but we're seeing a lot more of it and I think it will be uh, not a very long period of time before we start getting foldable screen phones just because they have to come up with something to get us to keep buying phones again. Apple, of course, is going through a pretty rough time right now uh, because they've kind of hit the limit as to what people need in a smartphone and they can't really offer anything new now uh, to get people to keep upgrading on a more regular basis. Uh, but something like this that offers a very different way to use your device might be something that would appeal to consumers and I can see companies looking to find the next big thing uh, going in this direction. So uh, I definitely think they're gonna happen. And I have to bring this up because as we start looking at these foldable screens, I think of a science fiction show that I watched 20 years ago uh, called Earth Final Conflict. And it was on Amazon Prime for a little while. I was, watch I was kind of catching back up on it again. It's kind of a cheesy 90s sci-fi show, but they 
uh, got the smartphone right in this. Now remember, this show came out in uh, 1998, and they had these little devices called the Globals, uh, which were these smartphone-like devices that do everything our smartphones do today, including FaceTime and computer functions and cameras. And then they had a screen that you could pull out uh, from the device that was larger than the device itself. So clearly in this sci-fi universe, this screen would roll up uh, inside of the phone. And I think we're finally getting to the point where uh, we might have a global, if you will, uh, version of a smartphone that uh, will deliver some of this functionality. It's a really amazing show because they got the smartphone down. Like they really predicted what it would be like to own a smartphone and use one. And uh, it was really fun to see that back in the 90s. And I was really thinking how cool it would be to have a device that would be that usable. And now we really do have devices that usable just without the foldable screens, but that's coming. And our pick of the week this week is a video all about a conversation piece that I have behind my shoulder here, uh, which is the Timex Sinclair 1000. Now, those of you in the UK might know it as the ZX81 from Sinclair because it is the same machine, uh, but Timex licensed it and brought it to the United States as a very inexpensive personal computer uh, back in the very early 80s. Uh, mine, I believe, still works. I haven't turned it on in probably 20 years, so I, maybe I should try to do that one day. I actually found my memory expansion unit for it in my uh, back room over there, so I still have all of my pieces to it, but the 8-bit guy actually boots them up and shows you how they worked and what you could do with them in this video. Uh, there was a prior version called the ZX80 that looks really terrible, actually. Every time you push the uh, key on the computer, the display would blank out because they didn't have dedicated video hardware on that thing. Uh, the uh, ZX81 and Sinclair 1000 didn't have dedicated hardware either, but they slowed the processor down to do its work uh, in between screen refreshes. Long story, but really cool stuff to check it out in case you're curious about some of the really low-cost computers that were around in the 80s. Uh, my dad got that Sinclair 1000 behind me on some crazy call-in show that was on New York television, uh, I think Channel 11 WPIX, again, back in the early 80s. It was this crazy auction show where this guy was shouting and people were talking down his price and then you would call in and buy this thing at the lowest price. And we couldn't yet afford uh, the Apple computer at that point. I think the Commodore was out there, but it was also very expensive. He got this little computer for, I think, like less than 100 bucks with all the different parts to it. And it was really my first real computer that I had at home until we uh, got the Apple II. So cool stuff. Uh, check it out on the 8-Bit Guys channel. Now this week on this channel, I've got a couple of things planned. We're going to be taking a look at the Lenovo IdeaPad 730S. You can see the unboxing of that on my Extras channel. It's a very lightweight computer, pretty cool stuff, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Uh, we do look at printers from time to time here on the channel, and this week we're going to be looking at a very inexpensive all-in-one from HP. It is black and white only, but if you are an occasional printer and don't like the cost of inkjet, this might be an alternative, so be on the lookout for that. And one of the cool things about doing what I do is that every once in a while, a company lets me borrow some really cool device that I'm really eager just to try out to see how it works. This is called the VidDU Go, and uh, Teradek makes this, and Teradek makes some really nice streaming boxes that uh, many professionals use to get their broadcasts out to the major streaming services like YouTube and Facebook and Twitch. And this one, of course, will do all of that uh, through your Ethernet network or via Wi-Fi. But you'll also notice there are some other antennas on it uh, because it has a bonded cellular connection as well. So it actually broadcasts over uh, multiple cellular carriers. They've got some service that uh, takes all that data in and then streams it out uh, to, again, Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, and others, and you're able to just go out on the road with it. Uh, so we're going to review this and play around with it until I have to send it back to them. It's going to be really fun, actually. Uh, so my plan is to do my usual review of the hardware and stuff, and then I want to see if we can just grab it, get in that minivan, and just go somewhere and see what happens. So uh, stay tuned for that. You might see me pop up on a live stream this week as we're playing with it. Uh, because it is something rather cool and it will be neat to see how it works in my area where the cell coverage isn't always uh, so great. Uh, this is the kind of technology they use on shows like Live PD on a and &E. I don't know if they use this exact device, but uh, Live PD is a great show that I watch every weekend here in the U.S. and they are able to follow police officers around anywhere they go 
uh, with similar bonded technology like this. And I think in the case of Live PD, they have 30 live feeds from all over the country that feed into their broadcast cent uh, center. And uh, this is one way you can replicate that. I think there's probably a lot of opportunity in high school sports and other things where you're not always sure about your connection. Uh, this might uh, do it for you. You've got to pay for the service and the hardware. We'll talk about uh, cost on all of this too. It's not as expensive as you might think it is. I think it's like 1500 bucks for the whole package, maybe a little bit more. Um, so again, not bad uh, considering what you can do with it. And we'll talk more about it a little later this week. And also, if you want me to try something with that, let me know. I'll add it to the list of things that will uh, do with it. Now, if you want to help support the channel, you can. You can make a one-time or a monthly contribution to my support page at lon.tv support. We still support Patreon as well. Uh, we also have our ongoing relationship with Plex because in addition to the sponsorships they do, we also have an affiliate arrangement with them. So if you sign up for a free Plex account, no credit card required, we get a little commission. Uh, we get more, of course, if you sign up for a Plex Pass or gift it. We have other channels you can watch me on, including my extras channel for unboxings and supplementary content. We have my podcast channel, which is this show in audio form that you can listen to. And some of my interviews are on there as well. We have my snippets channel at lon.tv slash snippets for uh, portions of this show that we break up into search-friendly components so people can find different parts of the show when they're looking for something. And then we've got my live stream archive at lon.tv slash live streams. I do ask you to click on that bell if you like what I do so you can get notified every time something new happens here on the channel. And of course, we've got other ways to engage with me. We have the email list, which is very occasional at lon.tv slash email, where if we've got some big thing going on in the channel, I will notify you. We have my Facebook page where we post up some of the videos I do here. I found that the uh, unboxings do better than the reviews on Facebook, so we'll probably be doing more shorter form uh, hands and uh, technology kind of videos up there, so be on the lookout for those. And then we have the Facebook group where we've got over 500 of you in now talking to each other, just like we had from that comment on foldable screens. So definitely join that if you haven't already. And then we have my store at lon.tv slash store where I sell things that I previously reviewed. Uh, we just sold that uh, little smartphone that I looked at last week. That went in about 20 minutes. And it went so quickly because I have an alert that goes out every time I add something to the store that you can find at lon.tv slash store alert. And when I put something up, I email it out and uh, you have a shot at buying a new item uh, at a much lower price than new. And until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thank you all for watching on a regular basis. It means a lot. All of those comments are great. Keep them coming. And I look forward to presenting some really cool stuff this week and in the weeks to come. And we'll be getting back to doing some premieres of this video uh, probably next week or the week after uh, once my schedule smooths out a little bit. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.tv supporters including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, The Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Anuj Zaveri, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.